Welcome everybody to Interfaith Week at Holden Village. We're so happy to join you. My name is Terry Kylo, and and before we get started, we're going to have an, intro, an introduction from Sharon from Holden Village. Sharon. Hi, my name is Sharon Query. I'm an education coordinator from Holden, though I'm coming to you from Minnesota since I'm not in the village this summer. Just um, on behalf of Chuck and Peg, we're hiking down from Cloudy Pass as we speak. Um, we'd like to welcome you all and thank you so much for, for, for participating. And thanks to Terry for all his organizational work. Thanks, Terry. Hey, it's been really great. This will be the fourth year now that we've had an interfaith week at, with Holden Village and what is now called Paths to Understanding, which uh, is a merger between the Tracy Levine Center and Neighbors in Faith. And uh, so we're so happy to be, be partnering with Holden around this. And we all wish we could be with everybody up at Holden, but of course uh, that, that just can't be this year. And so we decided to continue with some, some uh, conversations this week. We actually started last night with an intro introduction to Islamic art which you can watch on either uh, Facebook page of Holden Village or Paths to Understanding. Um, it'll also be up on YouTube, as will all of these. There's also some other videos that we pre-recorded, and we encourage you to go to pathstounderstanding.org. If you click on Holden Interfaith Week, you'll have access to all those videos and links to YouTube and podcasts and all that kind of fun stuff. So first, just some, some brief um, introductions here tonight. Uh, first, we want to say welcome to Imam Adam Jamal. Um, who is the imam at the largest masjid in Washington State, the Muslim Association of Puget Sound in the Redmond, kind of Sammamish area. Um, welcome, Adam. And, and the really cool thing is Adam didn't have to Google how to, how to get into his own room to, to, uh, to Zoom with us. So, because uh, the first time he looked up uh, finding Holden Village, there was no way to get there. So um, we also want to welcome Rabbi Johanna Kinberg, who's been serving as the as a rabbi of Kolami since 2014. Um, rabbi, rabbi, we're so happy to have you with us. Thank you. And then uh, additionally, we have with us tonight uh, Pastor Bethany Hull Summers, who's the pastor of Burlington Lutheran Church in Burlington, Washington. Bethany, welcome. Thanks. I'm so glad everybody's here. So our our conversation tonight is about the bane and blessing of love for our in-group. And uh, this uh, particular conversation started actually at Holden Village um, as we were sitting around one of the tables eating dinner, I think, after we would concluded most of our sessions last year, and just thinking about what some of the challenges are facing our society. And so I'm going to do a little introduction to that right now, and then we're going to get started on some conversation. We'll, we'll be able to take, take in some of, the, um, of your questions via Q&A whether that's on Zoom or whether that's on Facebook as you're watching on Facebook Live. So we'll be monitoring all of those and we'll have time for some questions and we'll try to provide some responses and conversation later. So here's a little introduction to this to topic, the blessing and bane of love for our in-group. It is not good for the human to be alone, God says in Genesis chapter two. This is true on every level. We quite literally depend on our family for our existence and our larger in-group for protection and support. It is good that we are not alone. But our in-group is also not alone. Our in-group can compete and cooperate with other groups. When scarcity rises, either real or imagined, human beings are vulnerable to conflict, even when cooperation might be a more life-giving option. Fra Franz Boas, the founder of modern cultural anthropology, observed, that among many peoples, the only people defined as human were those of their tribe. For instance, the German word Deutsch comes from a root word meaning human. Human beings often think of our own culture and in-group as superior to others, and that other cultures are measured by one's own culture. In a book by David Livingstone Smith called Less Than Human, he writes, when we dehumanize people, we think of them as counterfeit human beings. It, not only, it only takes a step or two, having decommissioned our moral inhibitions, he writes, to begin a cycle of violence. It is good that we are not alone, but our in-group is also not alone. What do our traditions teach us about the blessing and bane of our in-group? So thanks again for joining us. And, and tonight, I've been selected to go first, and so I'll, I'll give it a try. Um, each of us will have between six and eight minutes or so to share a few 
uh, reflections before we start some conversation with all of you. So about 30 years ago, my brother-in-law, Pete, uh, fell off a ladder uh, in his shop in a farm in Eastern Washington State, and he shattered both his ankles. And that happened um, after his crops had been put in and fertilized and everything, but there was no way he was going to be healthy enough to be able to harvest his crops. And so something along the lines of 23 to 25 farmers showed up with their combines and their trucks, and they harvested his entire crop in about two-thirds of a day. And it was just so inspiring to see all these combines all lined up on, these, on the hills in eastern Washington state and all the truck drivers there, all the farmers donating their, their, their time, their diesel, their machines uh, to help my sister and brother-in-law uh, in what was a very difficult time for them. And that really is, is part of what makes an in-group so beautiful, right? That, that we know that someone's there for us when we are down, when we are hurt, when we're in need, we know that someone's gonna be there for us. And that's just such a beautiful thing. And it helps us to survive, of course. Um, and yet we also know today with the rise of, of hate groups across the country, with the rise of kind of partisan politics, kind of getting an edge that, that, that we haven't seen for a while, that, um, that in-group and out-group conversations can be quite difficult. And we also know the same thing around issues of race. Um, and so we're at a moment where, um, we're, where I think as a, as a white male Christian pastor, I think we're at a moment of particular repentance. Um, and I, and I want to talk about that, that just a little bit, um, tonight with regard to in-group and out-group thinking. So when, when Jesus, uh, was growing up in Palestine in the first century, of course, the biggest challenge was that Rome was occupying Palestine. And, and from, as we read the Gospels, we kind of see you know, a couple of, of responses that he made uh, to that Roman-occupied kind of oppression uh, and, and the fact that the Romans were basically eating the lunch money of, of the people of Israel and, and all the other groups that were there, Samaritans and Syrophoenicians and everyone there, the Romans were basically taking their money and dominating them and exploiting them. And so what we see in the, in the Christian scriptures is, is Jesus trying to attack two essential issues that were facing his people at that time. One was that love for people in our in-group had, had kind of gone away. It was, it was being fractured uh, under the strain of so much scarcity. Folk were feeling like there just wasn't enough and they couldn't really share any. Um, without, without hampering their own survivability. And so we see both in John the Baptizer and in Jesus, um, and particularly in the, in the Sermon on the Mount or the Sermon on the Plain, Jesus saying that it was time for his people to start loving their members of the, their own in-group, to share food with them, to share a cloak with them, to share a house with them if people were unhoused, um, and to really um, also take time to forgive for all of the ways in which they had not been loving members of their own in-group, they had not been there to help harvest the crops uh, when, when each other were down. And so there's a lot of conversation in the Christian scripture about how to love your in-group. And, and I think that's, that's really powerful. But there's also another piece um, in the Christian scripture that's also present, which is as, as he's encouraging people to love their in-group, and start sharing food and resources and, and, uh, and coming up with baskets full of fish and loaves uh, in plenty um, afterward, we also see uh, Jesus addressing how his community was going to deal with the out, other outgroups that were present, particularly the Roman Empire, but not just them. Um, Syrophoenicians, Samaritans, um, and so many Canaanite you know, folk um, all kinds of different people, including Romans and Roman soldiers. How were they to, 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 to deal with, with the, uh, the people who were part of whatever outgroup um, were around? And so Jesus was very clear that, that they were to love their neighbor, that they were to see everyone as their neighbor, and they were even to love their enemy, who was also their neighbor. 
Um, and so Jesus advocates in this really challenging environment where the Romans are basically creating scarcity, which tends to make us all pull inward and be, be a little bit more uh, careful with our resources. Um, Jesus tells them not only to love their members of their in-group and be generous to them, but also to do so toward people that were part of uh, various outgroups. And so, of course, today, um, with the murder of George Floyd and so many of us becoming ever more aware of, of, of Christian white supremacy, of institutional and structural racism, much of which has been uh, kind of authorized by the sort of out, if, you're, if, if you're part of an outgroup, you don't matter. Um, I think we're in a time of, again, particular repentance. And what's been occurring to me is that a lot of Christianity on this continent has been filtered through uh, white Christian supremacy. And a lot of this goes back to 1452 with Pope Nicholas V. And I'm going to read a brief statement that he was writing to some kings and queens in Spain as they were hoping to, to kick out Muslims and Jews from Spain. And so, and so this, this document, Pope Nicholas offers Jesus, and in fact, he's offering, claiming to offer God's, uh, God's blessing to do some pretty horrific things. Uh, he writes, We grant you by these present documents, with our apostolic authority, full and free permission to invade, search out, capture, and subjugate the Saracens, that is Muslims, and pagans, and any other unbelievers and enemies of Christ, wherever they, they may be as well as their kingdoms, duchies, counties, principalities, and other property, and to reduce their persons to perpetual servitude. So Pope Nicholas at that point was offering divine sanction uh, to kings and queens in Spain, and then later on in 1492 and 1493, and in some other statements afterward, um, basically divine sanction to take people's lands, to murder them, to uh, make them slaves, and to do so calling them enemies of Christ, which basically turns Christianity into like an in-group that despises, wishes to exploit, has no problem killing, murdering, or enslaving, or stealing the land of people who are in an out-group. And in fact, I think so much of the time when I hear us preach in the Christian church, sometimes in ways that are very clear and some ways that are more subtle, we sort of confuse salvation, that is God's love for us and the healing of human societies and, and, the, and the earth, with just simply being part of an in-group that believes some of the same stuff. And so I, I think Christianity has in some ways... Um, sort of warp the teachings of Jesus, who taught us to love our in-group, but also taught us to love our any out-groups that are around, and to wish them well, to speak well of them, to be a blessing to them, and turned all of those, all, all people and other in-groups into enemies of Christ, and therefore not quite human. And I, I think that that that, um, that, that that we have to do some serious thinking and feeling and praying and study and repentance about that. Because I think right now, um, we, have, we have used our, our, our kind of tendency, human tendency toward love of an in-group in a way that, that is actually quite toxic. So one last story to conclude. Um, there was a, a, a man uh, in, in London who was uh, at a Black Lives Matter protest. And there was a counter protester there who got, got hurt. And, this, and this, uh, this black man picked up this guy and pulled him out of, of the crowd and, you know, basically saved him from further harm. Um, seeing this counter-protester essentially still as a human being. And, and I think that right now uh, we need to pick each other up and recognize that God is picking us up um, and helping us to see each other differently and to help recognize the basic humanity of people, whether they're in our in-group or not. Uh, so that's, that's my six to eight, probably 10 minutes. 
Um, and I'd like to maybe invite, uh, invite uh, in the uh, Imam Adam to go next. Hello everyone and assalamu alaikum, peace be upon you all. Um, very nice to be here. Um, I wish it was at Holden like it has been for the past two years, but unfortunately the circumstances mean that we're here, but we're here together and that's what I appreciate and I appreciate being here with you all and uh, for, for having some time with you all uh, today and this week. Um, so when it comes to how, I guess for with, with Islam, since I know that Islam is not something that people learned about a whole lot in school. I remember spending maybe a few days in it when I was in high school. Um, so I wanted to just kind of stick to some of the, the basics. And what you'll notice is that Islam teaches a lot of the same things that Christianity and Judaism teach um, about all of humanity and all of mankind. Um, so the first verse I wanted to share was a verse from the Quran, chapter 49, verse number 13, where, and the Quran is this book that was revealed to uh, the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, by angel Gabriel. And that's what we as Muslims, that's what we believe. And so one verse from that book is, O mankind, we created you from a single male and a single female and made you into nations and tribes that you may know each other. And the most honorable of you in the sight of God is the one that is the most righteous. And so in this verse, what I took away from this verse, when it comes to our topic today, is this idea of us being one humanity. And we all, going back to our original, our original, I guess, beginnings, um, Adam and Eve, the story of Adam and Eve, going back to that and going back to this idea that we're all from the same, stemming from that same seed. And so for all of us to be this one humanity is very important. And in the Quran, God talks to people that are in, I guess, as you said, Terry, the in-group, those believers in the in-group. And then he also addresses all of mankind, um, like, he did, like he does in this verse, which is, oh, mankind. We created you as male and female. And so that, that address in the Quran kind of leads Muslims to think about, well, okay, in some places, God has talked to Muslims in particular. Like the one of the really interesting verses I always found is the one that says, oh, you who believe, believe. Right? Oh, you who believe, the command is to believe. Right? Not that you're not believing, but are you, are you actually, I guess, walking the walk? instead of just talking the talk. So all you believe, believe. So that's one side. And then the other side is an address to all of mankind. And so that kind of changes our, our focus where, okay, well, God isn't just talking to us, but God's talking to everyone. And he's showing us that there's a message here beyond just the message to us. And another, I think, important, um, an important tradition is in the life of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was in his final year. And he made the pilgrimage. So um, actually in my intro to Islam presentation that I did for Interfaith Week, which was pre-recorded, I talked about that. And so the pilgrimage is this once, it's an event once a year, actually it's going to start on Wednesday this year. Um, and um, every Muslim is required to go for pilgrimage once in their life, um, as long as they're financially and physically able to do so. And so it's one of the largest gatherings of human beings on earth. There's 2 million, 3 million people there. And the amazing thing about it is that there's people from all over the world, all the different races, cultures, backgrounds, um, and each group, you know, people are together and they're also like uh, inter, in, inter, intermingling and no matter if you're rich or poor, you're wearing the same clothes. And so there's this idea of one humanity. And so when the Prophet Muhammad made his final pilgrimage to the city of Mecca, um, he said that, he said to, to a group of basically, it was all Arabs and I'm not Arab, my family is not Arab. But he said to a group of essentially 
tens of thousands of Arabs, he said, no Arab is better than any non-Arab, nor is any black person better than any white person, nor is any white person better than any black person. And so I think there was that, and that's an idea I think we can all agree upon. There's, there's that universal. Um, in Islam, we have this concept of, of the Arabic word is fitra, which kind of means your primordial nature, that you're born in a certain way, and then it's your environment that kind of takes you away from that. And that when you are born, you're predisposed to certain things. Um, if you look at children, uh, children, they don't see color. I have a three-year-old, a 10-month-old. They don't see that. But it's the environment that takes them in a different direction. And so we believe that that nature, that original nature that we're born with, that innocence, that's something to look to. And that's something to take. Obviously, there's also the, te the temper tantrums. Those are different. <laughs> but aside from those, at least when it comes to, when it comes to how he views people um, and that environment, how it shapes his views and how it shaped our views, I think it's important to take that into account. And that's what one of the things that our religion teaches us is, um, uh, that's what Islam teaches us as Muslims is that you have that, going back to that nature, going back to that predisposition to, to not see color, to not see those things and to see us as all, we're all people and to respect each other for that. And the final tradition I wanted to share with you all was something I think that um, there's a misconception out there um, about how, how Islam <laughs> talks about other groups. And one of the things I wanted to share was the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. He said that beware, whoever is cruel to a non-Muslim minority, curtailing their rights, overburdening them, stealing from them, I will complain to God about that person on the day of judgment. And so this idea of justice has to be not only to people that are in the in-group, but also in the out group. Um, and it's especially important for the majority to think about it because um, as Muslims in America, we're 1% we're uh, of the population, maybe less than that. And I think it was Pastor Terry who very eloquently said that there's, there's enough of us to, to be talked about, but too few of us to be truly heard and understood. Um, and that's where we, we need your help. That's where we need events such as this. And so I'm really happy that that's there to help with some of those misconceptions that are out there uh, about the Islamic faith and about some of the things that, that we may see because there's a difference between the practitioners of the faith who can a lot of times fall very short of the faith. And Christians know that, Jews know that, Muslims know that, Hindus know that, everybody knows that. Uh, uh, and the, the practitioners of the faith can fall short of what the actual faith says. And that's important to keep in mind. Um, you know, Muslims here don't agree with everything that goes on overseas, just like Christians, I'm sure, don't agree with the neo-Nazi party in, in Christian Greece um, or everything, or Jews don't agree with everything that Israel does, right? There's, there, there has to be that, that, that difference between, okay, the practitioners, the, the governments, modern day governments, and what the faith actually says. Uh, all right, that's it for my piece. I'll let, uh, I don't know who's next, Bethany or Johanna. I don't know. I'll let you, all you make that call, Terry. I think you're muted, Terry. Let's, let's, uh, let's have Bethany go next, uh, and then the rabbi can combat, combat uh, cleanup uh, for us. Okay, we can make a Lutheran sandwich. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Mine, um, though, what I wanted to share with y'all has is more of a personal narrative, uh, less heavy on the theology, um, more of a story. I, as Terry mentioned, unfortunately, Christianity does not always reflect beautifully or appropriately the teachings of Christ. So our experience could be a departure from those teachings. I was born into a family that was evangelical, went to an evangelical church that had a lot of fundamentalist teachings. 
and I then went to, so I went to church on Sunday mornings and Sunday evenings and Wednesdays, and I also attended a Christian school. It was not until I was in the second grade and I did U8 soccer that I met someone who did not attend church regularly. And I was horrified. It was scary to me as an eight-year-old to meet this seemingly nice man who was coaching our soccer team who did not attend church. Um, I had asked my parents a lot of questions about that and God bless them. They were not, that was not what they were trying to communicate to us as children, but it's just our experience because I was so embedded in that in-group all the time at school, at church, and our social circles. So I grew in that and had to actually seek out opportunities to experience something other than that. Thankfully, uh, the Holy Spirit is incredible and filled my heart with inclusiveness. So even as I was being taught some of these more narrow ideas, it didn't resonate with what I experienced of God. It didn't resonate what I experienced when I walked into nature and I saw the beauty and it didn't, ex it didn't resonate with my experience with other people who were not, did not fit in that narrow box that I had been taught they were supposed to fit into. So even though I had heard some of these messages, those other, the, the spirit, the messages in, from, from the scriptures, um, the, the evidence in my parents and other people of faith penetrated that, those things and helped my heart grow. So then when I was called to be a pastor, I did so with trepidation because I'd never seen a female do that before. And, and followed that path. I ended up becoming ordained in the same denomination that I grew up in, mostly because I was at a United Methodist Divinity School, and to be quite honest, I didn't want to be assigned at a church. <laughs> That's what the United Methodist did. So I was, I was hesitant to join the United Methodist Church, and then one of my Divinity School professors told us that you should be a part of whatever church taught you about Jesus. So I decided to be ordained in that church and served for many years as a pastor and in, continued to have that expansive understanding of God at, until I was called one day by one of my superiors and asked about my thoughts about the inclusion of LGBTQ plus in the church. At that time, I under, my understanding was that we could um, have differences of opinion with folk in our denomination. I had come to the, to the realization that I could be in relationship with people who were more conservative than I were or felt more narrow than I did. And so I thought that that would be a reciprocal relationship and it was not. So I was at that time invited to leave that denomination that I had been formed in, that I had grown up in and learned about God, that I had been felt called to the ministry and then actually was able to serve and serve churches and serve in incredible places. So at that time, I was shaken and my sense of call was shaken, but unbeknownst to me this whole time, the spirit was at work. And I had already had relationships with folk like Terry and some other Lutherans in the Skagit Valley. And God created a bridge for me to become a Lutheran. I was able to transfer my ordination to the ELCA. And I now serve a church that reflects my heart that I believe reflects God's heart. And to me, the experience of being able to preach and proclaim in a space that truly welcomes all we have. Um, one of my parishioners is married to a Muslim man and he comes to church often. He is in our sanctuary um, and we have all kinds of different 
spoke and different expressions of faith and different levels of belief and disbelief and different, just, just so much diversity and so much beauty. To be able to proclaim that is an incredible honor and to be able to be a part of a community of faith that holds that as one of its central characteristics is an incredible blessing. I have served communion to people who had been rejected from communion in other places. I have baptized babies of couples that wouldn't get to have their babies baptized because of how they, how they love and who they have married. So the blessing to be able to understand what it feels like to be rejected truly and then to be able to turn around and in that same with the same calling that God has placed on my heart to be able to include and embrace and proclaim God's goodness and love has been amazing so while the underbelly sometimes of that in group stuff can be really damaging and we all have seen people in our ministries who have, have been deeply hurt. When we are able to see it and obliterate it in our communities of faith, it's a powerful, powerful statement of God's love. Thank you, Bethany. And, and now uh, let's, let's hear from you, Rabbi. Thank you. So this conversation about... Um, you know, particularism and universalism between our in-group and the out-group, um, us and them, or a relationship to the other is something that in Judaism we've been really agonizing with for about 2,000 years. And we have so much in our, in our tradition about wrestling with um, how to be in relationship with the other. And that's, the language is very explicit because um, our worldview for so many hundreds, thousands of years has been sort of us and everybody else. And, you know, sort of like those maps where there's New York City and then there's the rest of the country and it's all a blur. You know, and so I, because of our, our need to survive in the diaspora, um, starting, you know, at the time of the destruction of the Second Temple, it was all about survival. Well, that's all also when Judaism and Christianity sort of co-evolved out of the um, ancient biblical Israelite religion. And so we evolved in exile. And that will frame many, many conversations um, within your tradition about relationship to the other. And so we have, you know, these foundational teachings, and we have one very similar to what Adam shared that, you know, that the Midrash asks, why did God only create one person at the beginning so that no one could say, well, my ancestor was greater than yours, because we all descend from one human being. Interestingly enough, we also have a little bit later in Genesis, the story of the Tower of Babel, where we are, we all spoke the same language and probably had all the same culture and were completely unified as a hum as humanity, but then we messed it up by building this super tall tower. And in the Midrash also teaches about that, that people were building higher and higher and people were falling off, the workers, and dying and no one cared and they just kept building. And so God said, I'm destroying the tower and you all have to speak different languages now, which means you have to work to understand each other. And so that's part of being human and being tribes and nations and having difference is the holy work of humility and, not, um, and really being um, humble in, in God's sight um, through the work we do with each other. So there's this, you know, there's the particularism of, you know, the tribe, and then there's a relationship to the other. And that really is the conversation within Judaism. So we do, in Judaism, when you convert, you become um, Johanna, daughter of Abraham and Sarah. So every new per Jewish person gets Abraham and Sarah as their parents because the, the, the idea is that we all are the children of Abraham and Sarah, and so they're adopted into the family. So that's very familial and tribal, which means we're always going to be seeing the other through that lens. Um, 
Uh, but at the same time, we started out with a tribal God. When we crossed through the Sea of Reeds, the text says in, in Exodus, who is like you among the gods? So there seems to be <laughs> um, inconsistency with the belief in monotheism in that statement. And it's true that in the wanderings, they did believe that it was a tribal God, that yud heh vav -He, God's unspeakable name, that this was a tribal God. But Judaism evolved over time in the, in the biblical era, in the ancient Israelite era, to recognize a universal God. And really the God that you see in, it reflected in Islam, which is God is one, God is oneness, that it's not a tribal God, but it's a universal God. So we moved away from that. So the theology moved towards <laughs> everyone and everything being con connected, but our reality as a tribe um, did not move in that way. It moved in the way of um, after the destruction of the Second Temple, living in exile and being the other. And the history over those 2,000 years between then and now um, bore testimony to our challenge about of what it means to be other and what does it mean to be in relationship to others. So some of the things that have informed us over the many thousands of years, one is that when Ezra and Nehemiah came back to um, rebuild the second temple after the um, exile to Babylonia, after the destruction of the first temple in 586 before the common era, they instituted public Torah reading and they said, and you need to read it and teach it in the vernacular of wherever you live. So there was, there was a sense that wherever you're living, you are going to be literate in the language there. And those are some of the early indications about how we decided through over time to be in relationship with the other. We're gonna learn your language um, and we're going to, you know, and we're gonna even study our sacred text in it. Um, and so, but at the same time, they also at that time forbade intermarriage. So you can see there's this, this push and pull that we want to, um, you know, be in healthy relationship with the other in our community, but we also want to survive. And that's, that's been um, part of our story all, all along the way. So in the Talmudic era, after the destruction of the Second Temple, there's so many um, laws and discussions about how can you, you, that you have to follow civil law wherever we're living and respect that and that, that you need to be a good citizen of wh wherever you're living. This is all with the assumption that we're in exile and that we are the other. So, you know, that, that's a big piece of the story is there's sort of the, the cultural, ethnic, tribal reality, and then there's the spiritual reality. And where it comes together today, at least in our congregation, is that we are a very universalistic Reform Jewish congregation where both Jews and non-Jews have um, a role in our community because we're 70% interfaith. And so many of the people who are part of our worship, our celebrations are not Jewish. And so we actually have changed some of our liturgy and one of our um, closing prayers used to say, thank you God for not making us like them the other people. And we took that out and, and we have different language and we say now, and yes, it is a very old 1500 year old prayer. We changed it um, because that's what we do. And we, and we said, thank you God for calling us to service, to serve you in, in the way of our people. And we've changed the language to reflect our spirituality and to reflect the reality of our communities. And so we're in that constant push and pull, um, but it's a good, it's a good struggle to be in. Thank you. So I would invite all of us now to kind of unmute for a few minutes and let's just have some conversation about what we're, uh, what we heard in each other. And um, I'm, I'm particularly interested um, you know, in, in how much of, of this in-group, out-group uh, com conversation and dynamic, how much of that's just part of us and how much of that has to do with the, the context in which we are, are in, how much of that has to do with the, the specific context, you know, and, and I'd be curious, uh, you know, to hear um, from, from, from both you, Adam, and Johanna about like how much, how much nature and how much sort of nurture or context is involved in situations where human beings kind of get out of whack with respect to their in-group and their out-group. So 
So uh, I guess, Johanna, you're looking at me, I think. I can't tell. <laughs> My glasses. <laughs> I can go if you can. I was just thinking, and I don't know if this, is the, if this is also true in the Muslim community, but you can have different, you know, people who can't, Jews came from Eastern Europe and some settled in the United States, but some settled in Mexico. And the Jewish community of Mexico City is very different than Jewish community, say, in Texas. Very, very, very different. The Jewish community of Mexico City is like super tight. Everybody comes to the synagogue. They have day schools. They have, you know, every, everybody is like very, very tight knit. While Jews in the United States, um, say Texas, would be very different, very assimilated. And only the, the most religious would live sort of close by to each other and see each other regularly, like many times a day. So I think that, it, that, that the environment where people are settling, if you're, you know, a, a group of immigrants, um, can really influence the nature of the in-group, out-group attitude. Yeah, I think, I think I've seen that as well. Um, you know, coming to like coming from Texas, where the I guess at least the because because in, in amongst the Muslim community you have uh, a third which are Black Muslims who uh, their ancestry goes back to slaves who were brought over, and twenty percent of those slaves being Muslim from Muslim countries in Africa, um, and so you have a third that are kind of I guess we, we could kind of go by Indigenous Muslims, and then we have. Uh, another two thirds that are immigrants, and most of the immigrants, um, they came in the 1960s, 70s, after the Asian Immigration Act to to the U.S. And so we owe a lot of our presence here to the civil rights movement. Um, at least the immigrants amongst us. My parent, my dad moved from Pakistan in 1971 to the University of Houston, and that wouldn't have been possible without the the civil rights movement. And anyway, I think. The, the the community, the Muslim community in Texas is different from the Muslim community here in Seattle. Because in Seattle, people immigrated over for tech, right? So for for Microsoft, for Amazon, or I guess Microsoft first, and then Amazon at Boeing and Expedia, uh, and so on. Um, and more recently for the other kind of software companies. So it's it's a younger community. It's a smaller community compared to the one in Texas. So yeah, I think that definitely that definitely does make a difference in how close knit, how tight knit, uh, and then there seems to be that certain tipping point where once it gets to a certain population, then people kind of integrate more or assimilate more. Um, whereas before that, it's about preservation, kind of like you you mentioned the banning of intermarriage because you kind of feel that need for self preservation, um, and so that that happens, yeah. So, I, so I'm, I'm sort of hearing both of you talk about the fact that it's, it really is nature and nurture together. And, but, but, but I'm hearing a lot of it around the, 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 con, you know, the, the, the context is really incredibly important about how that plays out. And um, Bethany, is there anything you'd like to offer? Um, I know Christians sometimes, we have a, a lot of views in the Christian church about, you know, what we would call human nature. Um, and... Uh, and I think some of them tend to be a bit, a bit overly negative in some ways, because uh, in ways that kind of um, make us a little bit authoritarian sometimes, because, because some Christian views about human nature are so negative that it sort of implies if you don't have a strong government sort of policing, you know, people all the time, that they, they won't love each other, um, which I think is, is really sad. But I, I, I think that from a Christian point of view, you know, whatever, whatever human beings are vulnerable to with respect to harming each other, not loving ourselves or our neighbor or caring for the earth, um, we're all, we all have those capacities, every single one of us. Uh, as, uh, as the Apostle Paul, you know, writes, uh, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And, uh, and so whatever sin is, we're all in it together. But, but sin isn't the only game in town because we're also created in the image of God. And and nothing about about uh, sin uh, obscures that or can 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 make that go away because that's what that's who God made us to be. Um, so it's just, it's interesting to hear you know both of you have a little different take on that human nature and and uh, and the context of uh, in which we find ourselves and how that how those interplay. Well, and there's also that sense of what Johanna was saying that there was. An expectation that every 
the Jewish community would be the other. And in the United States, we have the Christianity is our sort of national faith. And there's sort of a, um, a this, this co-opting of patriotism and, and Christianity that is intermingled and people almost call it the same thing. And to me, there's a difference between trying to survive such as probably the folk in Mexico City, I don't know when they immigrated there, but it's possible that they had to do business with one another. They had to protect each other because there was, you know, the other religious majorities were not, were not going to hang with them. And the difference between that and then keeping power and control are very different. And so I think that the Christian faith in the United States reflects that because it has gotten into the space of, of power and um, the fear of losing that control and power causes a manipulation that is not part of our faith. It's, it's something different that has come out of it. And um, I think that's probably can be true in other religious traditions, but this is where we are here and now. And it's disturbing to me <laughs> as a Christian pastor when I hear a lot of things that, about what it means to be a Christian that I don't think have anything to do with being a Christian. And um, so I think that for, for, for us, it's fear and control that have to do with, cause there's no, we don't have to survive, you know, this, a Christian, like the, the church that I grew up in, I wasn't going to be rejected by my community because I was a Christian, but there, there was a fear and control that needed to happen, which is why I think that I was sort of taught those kinds of things and tried to keep in that little box. Yeah, which is why I think uh, Christian white supremacy, you know, is is used as the the the, the foundation or the divine um, sanction for white supremacy, you know, so often in this in this country, and I think it really has, uh, as you said, Bethany, kind of. Um, it's sort of woven in and throughout uh, much, much Christian conversation, much of our worship services, even some of our hymns. I mean, we've got some real work to do to untangle and, and keep pulling that out. And I, I don't think it will ever, that untangling will ever go away. I think we have to just continue to work at that. Um, I, I'm, I'm wondering about, about, you know, the, the in-group, out-group, you know, dynamic with respect to, um, you know, to what we're experiencing right now in the country in response to the murder of George Floyd. And, uh, and Adam, you know, I'm, I'm always so inspired by the, by the, um, by the quote that, that you share from, from the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that, that, that there's no superiority, you know, between people of different uh, sort of, you know, skin colors and, and eth ethnicities. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering what our what the conversation we we're having around in groups and out groups has to do with with racism today and, and what what our traditions as part of the larger Abrahamic traditions what we might what we might say about about this moment uh, where we're reckoning with with so much injustice and systemic institutional racism. I think religions have had a lot to say about framing for human beings what is a life, who is human, and the rela different relationships between human beings and animals, and um, what is okay to use for your own profit as a human being and what is not okay to use. And so, you know, many religious traditions give parameters for that. Um, and the, um, so I think that's an important part of the conversation is that we, um, you know, will decide sometimes that people are not humans. Yeah, you know, we decide that, they, that they're the terms of their humanity or whether they're human or not. And we also decide, you know, when life began, I mean, that's like, you know, like religions will make those kinds of determinations. And so as long as we have, you know, religions have that power over other people to make those determinations and you have unrighteous leaders um, who are going to privilege, you know, 
the in-group profiting. And I think that, you know, racism in the United States is so linked with capitalism and our economy. And those are some of the very hard things that, you know, that self-interest, and this is um, sort of what I got at the summation from reading um, Abram Kendi's book, um, How to Be an Anti-Racist, is that the core root problem of racism is self-interest, and self-interest in this country. And so when you can make all kinds of determinations about who and what and who's worth what, <laughs> um, you have a real problem. And religion in this country has very much um, uplifted those notions. Christianity, yes, but Judaism too, in terms of being complicit in, in allowing for all these racist structures to exist. Yeah, um, you got me thinking, uh, Johanna, about um, our kind of in our in our faith the understanding of the devil mm -hmm. and um, there's this idea that the devil whispers and that the, I, the the devil he plots and that the devil takes you along on a long journey and it first starts with something small and then it becomes bigger and bigger um, and I think that's what that's what it is that the de dehumanization process doesn't happen at once but it's over a very long period of time. Um, and I remember thinking about that painting that, that Terry showed us back at Holden, you know, with the, was it the, uh, who was it? There was that angel or something and- It was the goddess, uh, it was sort of a, 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 a depiction of the goddess of the spirit of Columbus. That's what it called was. Columbia. Yeah, Columbia, yeah, that's what yeah. it was. Yeah, not the angel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I knew it was something with wings. I couldn't remember. <laughs> That's all right. But I understood the, the, the idea behind it. And that was, that was really powerful because that was, that's kind of where it starts, right? It starts with our understandings, our art, our, um, it's all reflected there. And so it's, it's an overtime process and it's not going to change overnight, but um, I think that things are changing. I think that people have realized that enough is enough. Um, but at the same time, we can't let it fall out of the news cycle um, as things tend to do. Yeah. I mean, there was an awareness at our mosque, at our mosque. Um, usually when you talk to um, Muslims about racism, um, Muslims will say, oh, there's, there's no racism in Islam. You know, they'll quote the things that I quoted. Um, but in practice, it, things can be different, um, especially when you have people from different cultures, different backgrounds, who may or may not understand or know each other. Um, didn't grow up like, like a typical example of me as an Im immigrant. I don't know if you felt this way, Johanna, but um, when, as a young child, when I used to go back to Pakistan, that's where my, my, my parents are from Pakistan. So when I used to go back to Pakistan, um, I was an outsider. I was this American kid, you know? Like, I didn't understand Pakistan. I, my Urdu was like American Urdu, right? Uh, it, was, it wasn't good. You know, I didn't know how to talk like them. I didn't have their culture at all. And then you come back home and, and then you don't fully find yourself either. I was the only Muslim kid in school until I think until ninth grade or eighth grade. And so, that, you know, that was... So you, you're trying to find your location. Where do you fit in? How do you fit in? Yeah, I mean, this is very much my experience, though. My children have a different experience because the Pacific Northwest is much more religiously diverse than it used to be when I was a kid. So there are Buddhist kids and Muslim kids and Hindu kids and, you know, different kinds of um, religious kids and kids whose families finally feel free to say that they don't have a religion or they don't they're not, they don't they don't believe mm -hmm. in God and that used to also be something where you like you couldn't be in Cub Scouts unless you were willing to say that you <laughs> believed in God so it was you know there was a lot of um, and I think that that there was sort of a blind they, there was a, a, relig a religious blindness meeting like let's just wash over and everybody can be Christian-ish and Christian like, <laughs> and it was very it was very hard to be a minority in that. We did the play. I think it, yeah. was, it was a play about Jesus and Mary. We, we part, we, I was in the choir. And my teacher was like, "You have a great voice. You're in the, you're in the choir." I'm all right. Okay, I guess I'm doing good. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and and since and since there's a whole chapter devoted to Mary, hey, that was okay, right? <laughs> 
I guess so. Crime. I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've all, and I as as a Jew, I've always found it so interesting that Christianity had, was so segregated. Like that was something I could never wrap my head around because I couldn't. I didn't. I don't see it in Islam. There aren't like you know, there's, there seems to be a lot more integration, and, and in Judaism, we, we, it's, there's, you know, most Jews in this country are European, and those who are not have, sort of, they do have their own ethnic kind of congregations, but in Christianity, I was always surprised by, the, by how segregated it was, and it took me a really long time to understand why, and how. Well, you know, so, so part of that, that segregation, you know, has to do really not with anything necessarily particular to to Christianity as, or, or to, to the teachings of Jesus, for, for sure. But it has to do with the way that this, this country was formed. And that's why that the quote from the, from the Pope, which gave divine authorization to European kings and queens to take land, to, to, um, to, to, to claim it as their own, to, to, to murder and kill indigenous peoples, um, and the, the estimates are that 95% of the indigenous people uh, on, on the, the continents of, of, of North and South America uh, died as a result of their contact with, with European settlers and, and colonizers. So, and, so, and so when you've set up your entire system, you know, with divine sanction, and then you start benefiting from it. You know, you start, you start, you start, you know, so the, the, the farmland that, that my family farmed in Eastern Washington belonged to the Palouse, to the, to the Palouse Indians before 1855 and was, was taken from them, you know, really by, through a threat from Governor Stevens that said, if, if you don't sign this treaty, you'll be standing shin deep in your own blood. And so when you benefited from that and you, and you're going to church the whole time, you're singing songs to Jesus, you know, the entire time, um, and your 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 grandparents and great grandparents and parents and you yourself benefit from it. Like it's it's really um, it's really difficult to face that, and it's even more difficult, you know, to to face that in the presence of people in which the economic system you've benefited from have have been oppressed. Like that's really hard. Um, and yet I believe that, that, that all the Abrahamic faiths have some very powerful messages about, and, and, and I'll say it as Lutheran in this case, that God loves us the way we are enough to be wrong. God loves our grandparents and great-grandparents and parents enough for them to be wrong, to, to benefit from unjust systems. And so that means that we have the freedom then to say, we're not going to live like this anymore. And I hope that that's the moment we're in, is when yeah. we get, enough of us can say, we're not going to live like this anymore. Uh, and we're not going to do it just because we feel guilty or feel shame. Like God's big enough to deal with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's that narrative that, of blessing in the, in the Christian tradition of just like, oh, I'm, I'm, we're so blessed. And a, an assumption then of goodness from that, 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 because that is why the blessing has come. And um, it was a big part of rationalizing all of the evil. And as long as you could kind of try to cover it up with this veneer of religiosity, maybe it's okay. Because, um, yeah, that's, and then also to think that these other folk who are going to hell, essentially, because they don't believe the way we do, then they can be demonized and so there's just so much to that, Terry, and it's, ugh. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I, I totally agree. I mean, I think that that, that, that idea about, you know, the, the, the reason that people are, are say, say, unhomed, or the, the, the idea that behind people, the, the reason that people have, I mean, a lot of Christians will say this, the reason that, that people don't have homes or that people don't have money is because they've they've they're sinners and and God hasn't blessing them because they're they're not they're they're not uh, they're not doing what they're not they're not living righteously in some way and uh, boy that's that is self justification of a powerful kind right there. Yeah. 
Yeah, and it's difficult to try to grapple with the idea that someone who is suffering is innocent. And that, you know, that, that, so those folks that felt that way, I'm sure that it was difficult for them to try to, re to reconcile those two things, that they were benefiting so much and there's others that are suffering so much, um, which, as you said, God can cover all of that, but it still doesn't mean that it, we don't move forward in healing and re reconciliation and restoration. And, and, you know, no one community is immune. I think that there's the arc of the way the world works where people find themselves in different relationship to the other. And so, you know, Jews and Israelis find ourselves in different relationship to the Palestinians than we were, you know, 200 years ago. And, you know, the, our, our reality right now is that there's, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of um, Arab Israelis and Palestinians who are Hebrew speakers, more probably than our Hebrew speakers in the diaspora. So our language, which was something we held on to for so long, has also now become this language that has a very different relationship to another group of people through the course of, um, the, you know, human history and um, global dynamics. And it's it's a very difficult position to be in. Suddenly your relationship to the other shifts and you have to, you know, and you have to look and say, okay, we are now in a different power dynamic with that. And, we, we, and you can't, no one's the eternal other. Um, we all are sometimes the, the, you know, the other, but we're also sometimes the otherer sometimes too. And so, you know, dealing with both sides of that equation, um, is you know is is part of the work I think of spiritual communities is when you when you have the power to otherize people what do you do what do you, and and when you're the other how do you relate to the other side of the equation? So 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 Adam, if you want to say something, that's 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 great. But I I also just wonder about another question, which is, what are the you know if 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 you're in a situation where there's a ton of pain, where there has been institutional, personal, structural sin of various kinds of oppressions uh, toward all kinds of folk. Um, and you're in a situation where, where there's increasing scarcity as there kind of is right now with COVID-19 uh, ravaging the uh, human beings, ravaging people of color in, 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 in uh, much higher rates than, 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 uh, than white folk in the country, but also harming, harming the economy. Like, like, what's the basic view in, in Judaism and, and Islam about how you begin to achieve reconciliation? Like, what are some of the steps, you know, that, that, that your traditions indicate for how to, how to move through a time when we all realize something's broken? There's this, um, there's this, there's this story from the time of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him that we we were sharing recently during the um, the after the killing of george floyd and the events that transpired thereafter about i guess the healing that needs to take place and sometimes what that healing requires and so the story goes that there was two and it was a real a real event that happened in the time of prophet muhammad peace be upon him that there was these two companions we call them companions of the prophet uh, i guess similar to disciples or i guess it's a similar kind of idea um but there was these 12 the, these these two companions of the prophet one of them was a very rough and kind of rough and scruffy bedouin man from the desert um mecca is considered a city it's considered civilized even though it's in the desert as well but he was just from the bedouin he was just from the he was just a nomad and um he he was he was muslim and uh the other the other companion was Bilal, and Bilal was a, uh, a, a black Muslim, and he uh, used to be a slave, and then he was freed by, um, by Muslims. Uh, one, they bought him, and they, they bought him and freed him. And um, so the Bedouin man said to the black man, he said that he called him the, the, the son of a black woman, and in a derogatory manner. And Bilal was a, a very offended and he went to Muhammad and he complained about what the Bedouin man had said and Muhammad 
turned to the Bedouin man and told him that in you is still uh, some of the days of ignorance. They referred to the pre-Islamic period as the days of ignorance. And he said, some of the days of ignorance are still within you. Uh, oh, Abu Dhar, that was the guy's name. And uh, he felt it immediately because now the prophet's telling him and is pushing back on this idea and not letting him kind of get away with it. And he felt so terrible that what he did was he laid down on the floor and he told Bilal, Bilal, put your foot on my face uh, and tell me that you forgive me. I will not get up until you put your foot on my face because of what I have done to you. And just that kind of extreme form of asking for forgiveness, I think, and Bilal said, no, I'm not going to do that. You know, I'm not. And he, and he said, no, he kept asking him two, three, four times. And then um, eventually he, he, he gave up and Bilal just kind of tapped him with his shoe, you know, just kind of just to get him off the ground because it was causing a scene. And then, um, and then he accepted his apology. Mm -hmm. And just that idea of what are we doing for that healing to take place? What are we doing for that reconciliation to take place? How far are we really willing to go? Is it enough to just say sorry? Is it enough to, do we need to be doing more than that? I think that's the question that, that people have on their minds. And it's chilling the, the, the correlation between that story and how George Floyd died. Oh yeah. And how that could be turned around into an act of repentance. Mm -hmm. Well, I didn't even think of that. That's That's really, yeah, what an amazing connection. Wow. It's interesting, you know, coming from a very analytical and legalistic tradition now, I feel benefits me in answering this question because <laughs> within the Jewish framework, it's very, very clear what needs to happen. I um, mean, it's the process that we call teshuva repentance, which is if, if someone says you've wronged me and you, the first thing you do is you, you recognize and acknowledge what you did, you say, you make a statement and a declaration, I'm never going to do this again. Then you take all the steps necessary to make sure that it never happens again, and including restitution. And so from a, from a Jewish framework, um, reparations seem to be like, that's what needs to happen if for, for Black Americans, that it's this, that people were stolen, their energy, their lives, their possible inherited wealth was, has been, was stolen and has been stolen in a systematic way. We can prove it in a court of law. There's all kinds of evidence. Therefore, the only way to make the situation whole is to offer restitution. And we know this very intimately because Jews received millions and millions and millions of dollars of restitution from Germany, both families and the state of Israel after the Holocaust. So we're recipients of of that. That's part of our, of who we are in this world. And we have to acknowledge that we both benefit from it and that it's something that any, you know, other people who've been systematically oppressed and, and had been stolen from to be restored as close as, by, as possible. Well, I, I just want to say that, like, I think, I think in some ways, uh, you know, Christians would do well to, to go back and, um, and study uh, that process of teshuva, because I think that's what Jesus was talking about in the Christian scriptures when he talked about reconciliation in, in Matthew chapter 18 and reconciliation in other parts of the Christian scripture. But but the way it works in practice a lot of times for 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 Christians, and here I'm going to say some some heresy probably for some people in the Lutheran Church. Um, so I'm glad I waited till later in the in the in the, in the webinar, you know. <laughs> now but, for the real reason we're here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So so we've got this thing in the Christ, in the Lutheran tradition where either at the beginning of the worship service or after the sermon, depending on on your on your style there. Uh, there's this confet there's this public confession and forgiveness, where the where the the congregation reads this, you know, we've sinned before God and you know cannot free ourselves and that sort of thing. And then, and then a, a person like, like Bethany or myself will stand up and say, you know, um, in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven of all your sins. Without the thought that maybe you should be apologizing directly to the people you've hurt. Like, like maybe God's happy to, to provide, you know, like encouragement and forgiveness ultimately, right? Because the creator 
a sin against you, Johanna, is a sin against the creator who, who created you, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe we need the step of asking God for forgiveness in some ways to be able for me to be able to approach you. But I, I almost wonder if this isn't a moment where we need to have like a year long fast from third party forgiveness <laughs> without going and talking to the people that we've harmed and following that process of admitting what we did, you know, doing what we need to do to stop doing it, to desist of it, you know, to make restitution. I mean, I'm not getting quite all the Tejuva you know, uh, things correct, but do the restitution and then come to public reconciliation. Like, I just wonder if that's not where we are right now. And we actually, I think we also lean towards the, 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 the legal perspective, which is the restitution perspective. Um, we kind of, the, the way that uh, I learned it was there's the rights of God and there's the rights of people. And you can't go to God when you've oppressed or you've been unjust towards, towards the rights of people. And you have to, there, you can't, you get, the child can't say sorry to the teacher. The child has to go to the other kid, shake his hand you know, say sorry to him. And, and, and actually, both of those together, Teshuva and then that, that statement that you just said, uh, Adam, have really challenged my notion of, of what confession forgiveness can, can mean, what reconciliation is about. So in my, in my conversations with, with Muslims and, and my Jewish neighbors, like, those two things have, sh have shaken my entire notion of what what we ought to be you know focusing on in terms of reconciliation so that's that that's how i think interfaith conversation actually leads us deeper into our own tradition well, how's the how's the chat looking on the facebook and on well we're seeing lots of of, of people talking you know thanking us for for the conversation i haven't seen a lot of questions i'm i'm glad that you you brought that up um, um, so I'm, I'm seeing lots of thumbs up and great messages. Um, I'm not seeing a lot of a lot, a lot of questions here. So if if folk have any questions for our panelists, you know, we'll 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 be happy to to, to take take that whether that's on Zoom or on Facebook Live, um, either one. So um, you know, you know, Bethany, how how have you seen that whole forgiveness thing work out? I'm not asking you to sign on to my heresy there. But um, I, I am interested to know kind of how you see that whole confession and forgiveness thing working while we're waiting for a few questions. Yeah, no, I love that. And I was just trying to think of how I would wordsmith that at the end of not only just this sort of understanding of God's forgiveness, but then somehow some sort of directive and encouragement to move forward in repentance throughout the week. Um, so I think that's, I, I really like that. It's really cool. I never had that in my old tradition, that sense of um, that confession and forgiveness. There was sort of a, a soaking in your own sinfulness <laughs> in my other tradition that was kind of a revolving door of self-loathing and repentance sort of that, that made people feel a lot of guilt and a lot of angst. So, um, but I really, I, I like that idea. I'm, I am, I endorse that heresy. Well, it, so, so as long as you feel bad, really bad about what you did, maybe your mom and dad won't, won't try to punish you for it. Is that, <laughs> is that kind of the yeah. deal? <laughs> yeah, basically. Uh -huh. It's just a cycle of terror and yeah. I think there was this, uh, there's this joke, and I think it's been re, uh, re, oh, I got blurry all of a sudden. It's been re, uh, I guess, reapplied <laughs> to, I, I've seen it in, I've seen it for Hindus were using it and Muslims were using it. Um, and I just looked it up. But once I saw this guy on a bridge about to jump, I said, don't do it. He said, nobody loves me. I said, God loves you. Do you believe in God? He said, yes. I said, are you a Christian or a Jew? Do you know where this is going? No. He said, a Christian. He said, uh, I said, me too, Protest, Protestant or Catholic? He said, Protestant. I said, me too, what franchise? He said, Baptist. I said, me too, Northern Baptist or Southern Baptist? He said, Northern Baptist. I said, me too, 
Northern Conservative Baptist or Northern Liberal Baptist? He said, Northern Conservative ba Baptist. I said, me too. Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Region or Northern Conservative <laughs> Baptist Region? He said, Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Region. I said, me too. And then he said, Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Region Council of 1879 or 1912. He said, Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Region Council of 1912. I said, die heretic, and I pushed him over. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I've seen a Muslim so version of that, and I've seen a, a Hindu is, version of that. Yeah, I don't know that, if it's a Jewish version, but there's that for the in-group. I don't know. I, I totally understand that. And, that, and that's, where, that's where, like, I mean, we've got something like 35 or 36,000 Christian denominations in, this, in the United States alone because we, we, we have such a hard time engaging with difference, which I think has a lot to do with that. And those differences with that white exist, I, think. I mean, Muslims have, like I said, it's been readapted for, for Muslims as well. I just couldn't find the Muslim one. But um, so, so we have a question from Carolyn who asks um, What concrete steps can society take to work on apologizing and asking for forgiveness for the evil we all have done or permitted to our fellow human beings? So, what would be some steps? on a societal level that you all think we might, we might do. And that'll, that'll probably be our kind of final question here. Well, you have to look at who's at the margins, you know, when we were, when the Israelites were leaving Egypt, there was, you know, pay attention to the ones who are behind, you know, they're the ones who are going to be attacked by the Amalek first, you know, you, you, and so look at who's in the margins and then work to bring them into the center and to make those who were last first. <laughs> Yeah, so so it has to do with with listening to and centering on the voices of the of the people who've been harmed. And so the first thing is like to listen to them and believe them, and and take 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 that seriously, right? So that's like step number one because they're probably going to know a lot of what needs to happen, you know, to make to take that to take that next step. Is that what you're saying, Johanna? Yeah, well, it also just to shift the power center to, you know, to, in terms of concern and, and attention to, because with self-interest, if self-interest is at the core of all this, then, then you have to work against self, your own self-interest. If you're not working against your own self-interest, then, you know, and there's people who are suffering, then the equation is off. And that's, and so it means moving, you know, to it in a different direction. Yeah. There was, a, I guess, a, a miniature version of that, um, and I think it's something that everyone should do. Um, we had a listening session with um, Black youth in our community. We have a diverse community, different races, cultures, backgrounds, and um, um, but doesn't mean that you know it's a perfect place. And so we had a listening session with our Black youth about how they felt about racism and different things that they might have felt, the things they have seen or heard um, at the mosque. And so we had, we had a good three hour session where the board was there, the staff were there, we just listened. We didn't say anything, we didn't, there was no, there was no back and forth. It was just listening for three hours. Um, and it was, part of it was, okay, we're gonna take action on this, but part of it was speak without being interrupted and that the, the people speaking had to watch the time themselves and kind of make time for each other um, and then and otherwise you could speak without being interrupted and I think that was very very powerful for us to do and for us to have that. Bethany what do you what do you th what are your thoughts about what we need to do as a society about this? I think that 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 listening that listening piece is huge and that decentering um, is there absolutely and also this the sense of for those of us who hold the power we can't get caught up on our sense of guilt and and grief and and instead be mobilized by something greater than those things and that to me that God's love and and, the, and and justice and our our desire for equality and so somehow acknowledging the deep pains and hurts and inequality but at the same time not allowing our own 
grief from that revelation and guilt from that revelation to get in the way of real change. I think that's one of the hurdles we have right now because we have a lot of people who are doing things that they haven't ever done before, who are proclaiming Black Lives Matter and all this kind of, they're finally getting it. Um, and with that comes a lot of grief. And so, so somehow moving past that part, because I think that's where we are right now. And if we could easily get stalled here and easily feel like just feeling that is enough, but feeling that is not enough. We have to move from feeling that to acting together toward a different future. So that's my hope right now is that we just don't get stuck. You know, I, I, I agree with all of, with all, everything that's been said and just would add that, you know, institutional and structural, you know, evil or, or sin or, or oppression has to be addressed with structural or institution and institutional um, responses, right? So there are 18,000 uh, police jurisdictions in the United States. So wherever you are, get involved in that conversation. There are school districts, I don't know how many there are across the, 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 the nation, but there's a ton of them. Get involved in the way the curricula is being dealt with. Um, is it still teaching Columbus sailed the ocean blue and discovered America when there had been people here for 11,000, 12,000 years or more? Um, so, so get involved locally around some issue, partner with other people, um, and, uh, and, and help to, to, to move um, those policy, those, those, those laws, those rules, those institutions. Uh, join the Faith Action Network in Washington State if you're there. Um, do what, you know, lend your voice to those, uh, those organizations that are working for uh, institutional and structural change because it's not just a change of heart we need, it's a change of the way our system works so that everyone has um, has an equal chance and, and the human dignity of every person is honored and respected. Um, any, any final comments from any of you that you want to share before we conclude here? Well, I, with that, I just, I just want to thank Adam. I want to thank you for, for being part of this. This was a way easier drive than finding our way to hold in, but Hopefully next year we can. We well, can I know my way now. <laughs> I know you do. I know. And, and Johanna, I look forward to being with you hopefully next year and Bethany. And then our hope is that, that next year we're going to have a much bigger cast of characters, including uh, Buddhists and Hindus and some Native American speakers. And, and, uh, and Bethany, we're so thankful you're with us. Um, you can join, a, join us tomorrow night for uh, an art project with, uh, with, with Reiner Waldman Atkins, a Humanity Created in the Image of God, a Visual Art Biblical Midrash Workshop. So that'll be at 6 o'clock tomorrow night. And then Wednesday night at 6 p.m., we'll continue some conversation um, around the call to be a blessing to all the nations or families of the world. So we'll be talking about more of the positive side of in-group, out-group uh, kind of dynamics. And then finally, uh, on Thursday, there'll be a conversation with Reiner and with also Amina around, uh, around, around Jewish and and Muslim art, you'll be able to bring some of your art projects and kind of show them where they're at. I know I'm working on mine. I've been really enjoying that this week. And then lastly, on Friday at 6 p.m., we'll have one more show on human humanity um, as a part of the creation and what the Abrahamic traditions have to teach us about that. So we're grateful everyone joined us. Uh, we hope you have a great evening, and we'll hopefully see you all at Holden next year and, uh, and in chat rooms until then. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you for watching.